Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by M. R. James. A Vignette You are asked to think of the spacious garden of a country rectory, adjacent to a park of many acres, and separated therefrom by a belt of trees of some age which we knew as the plantation. It is but about thirty or forty yards broad. A close gate of split oak leads to it from the path encircling the garden, and when you enter it from that side you put your hand through a square hole cut in it and lift the hook to pass along to the iron gate which admits to the park from the plantation. It has further to be added that from some windows of the rectory, which stands on a somewhat lower level than the plantation, parts of the path leading thereto, and the oak gate itself, can be seen. Some of the trees, scotch firs and others, which form a backing in a surrounding, are of considerable size. But there is nothing that diffuses a mysterious gloom or imparts a sinister flavor. Nothing of melancholy or funeral associations. The place is well clad, and there are secret nooks and retreats among the bushes, but there is neither offensive bleakness nor oppressive darkness. It is, indeed, a matter for some surprise when one thinks it over, that any cause for misgivings of a nervous sort have attached itself to so normal and cheerful a spot, the more so, since neither our childish mind when we lived there, nor the more inquisitive years that came later ever noticed out any legend or reminiscence of old or recent unhappy things. Yet to me they came, even to me, leading an exceptionally wholesome and happy existence, and guarded, not strictly but as carefully as was any way necessary, from uncanny fancies and fear. Not that such guarding avails to close up all gates. I should be puzzled to fix the date at which any sort of misgiving about the plantation gate first visited me. Possibly it was in the years just before I went to school. Possibly on one later summer afternoon of which I have a faint memory, when I was coming back after solitary roaming in the park, or, as I bethink me, from tea at the hall, anyway, alone, and fell in with one of the villagers also homeward bound just as I was about to turn off the road onto the track leading to the plantation. We broke off our talk with good nights, and when I looked back at him after a minute or so, I was just a little surprised to see him standing still and looking after me. But no remark passed, and on I went. By the time I was within the iron gate and outside the park, dusk had undoubtedly come on, but there was no lack yet of light, and I could not account to myself for the questionings which certainly did rise as to the presence of anyone else among the trees, questionings to which I could not very certainly say no, nor I was glad to feel yes, because if there were anyone they could not well have any business there. To be sure, it is quite difficult, in anything like a grove, to be quite certain that nobody is making a screen out of a tree trunk and keeping it between you and him as he moves around it and you walk on. All I can say is that if such a one was there, he was no neighbor or acquaintance of mine, and there was some indication about him of being cloaked or hooded. But I think I may have moved at a rather quicker pace than before, and been particular about shutting the gate. I think, too, that after that evening something of what Hamlet calls a gain-giving may have been present in my mind when I thought of the plantation. I do seem to remember looking out a window which gave in that direction and questioning whether or not there was any appearance of a moving form among the trees. If I did, and perhaps I did, hint a suspicion to the nurse, the only answer to it would have been the hitty of such a thing, and an injunction to make haste and get into bed. Whether it was on that night or a later night, I seemed to see myself again in the small hours gazing out of the window across moonlit grass and hoping I was mistaken in fancying any movement in that half-hidden corner of the garden. I cannot be sure. But it was certainly within a short while that I began to be visited by dreams which I would much rather not have had, which, in fact, I came to dread acutely, and the point round which they centered was the plantation gate. As years go on, it but seldom happens that a dream is disturbing. Awkward it may be, as when, when I am drying myself after a bath, I open the bedroom door and step out on a populous railway platform and have to invent rapid and flimsy excuses for the deplorable dishevel. But such a vision is not alarming, though it may make one despair of ever holding one's head up again. 
But in the times of which I am thinking, it did happen, not often, but oftener than I liked, that the moment a dream set in, I knew it was going to turn out ill, and there was nothing I could do to keep it on cheerful lines. Ellis the gardener might be wholesomely employed with a rake and spade as I watched at the window. Other familiar figures might pass and repass on harmless errands, but I was not deceived. I could see that the time was coming when the gardener and the rest would be gathering up their properties and setting off on paths that led homeward or to some safe outer world, and the garden would be left to itself, shall we say, or to denizens who did not desire quite ordinary company and were only waiting for the word all clear to slip into their points of vantage. Now, too, was the moment when the surroundings began to take on a threatening look, that the sunlight lost power and a quality of light replaced it which, though I did not know it at the time, my memory years after told me was the lifeless pallor of an eclipse. The effect of all this was to intensify the foreboding that had begun to possess me, and make me look anxiously about, dreading that in some quarter my fear would take visible shape. I had not much doubt about which way to look. Surely behind those bushes, among those trees, there was motion, yes. And surely, and more quickly than seemed possible, there was motion not now among the trees, but on the very path towards the house. I was still at the window, and before I could adjust myself to the new fear, there came the impression of a tread on the stairs and a hand on the door. That was as far as the dream got at first, and for me it was far enough. I had no notion what might have been the next development, more than that it was bound to be horrifying. That is enough in all conscience about the beginning of my dreams. A beginning it was only, for something like it came again and again, how often I can't tell, but often enough to give me an acute distaste for being left alone in that region of the garden. I came to fancy that I could see in the behavior of the village people, whose work took them that way, an anxiety to be past a certain point, and moreover a welcoming of company as they approached that corner of the park. But on this it will not do to lay over much stress, for, as I have said, I could never glean any kind of story bound up with the place. However, the strong probability that there had been one once, I cannot deny. I must not, by the way, give the impression that the whole of the plantation was haunted ground. There were trees there most admirably devised for climbing and reading in. There was a wall, along the top of which you could walk for many hundred yards and reach a frequented road, passing farmland and familiar houses. And once in the park, which had its own delights of wood and water, you were well out of range of anything suspicious or, if that is too much to say, of anything that suggested the plantation gate. But I am reminded, as I look on these pages, that so far we have had only preamble, and that there is very little in the way of actual incident to come, and that the criticism attributed to the devil when he sheared the sow is likely to be justified. What, after all, was the outcome of the dreams to which, without saying a word about them, I was liable during a good space of time? Well, it presents itself to me thus. One afternoon, the day being neither overcast nor threatening, I was at my window in the upper floor of the house. All the family were out. From some obscure shelf in a disused room I had worried out a book, not very recondite. It was, in fact, a bound volume of a magazine in which were contained parts of a novel. I now know what that novel was, but I did not then. And a sentence struck and arrested me. Someone was walking at dusk up a solitary lane by an old mansion in Ireland, and being a man of imagination, he was suddenly forcibly impressed by what he calls the aerial image of the old house with its peculiar, malign, scared, and skulking aspect, peering out of the shade of its neglected trees. The words were quite enough to set my fancy on a bleak track. Inevitably, I looked and looked with apprehension to the plantation gate. As was but right, it was shut, and nobody was upon the path that led to or from it. But as I said a while ago, there was in it a square hole giving access to the fastening, and through that hole I could see, and it struck like a blow on the diaphragm, something white or partly white. Now this I could not bear, and with an access of something like courage, only it was more like desperation, like determining that I must know the best, 
I did steal down, and quite uselessly, of course, taking cover behind the bushes as I went. I made progress until I was within range of the gate and the hall. Things were, alas, worse than I had feared. Through the hole a face was looking my way. It was not monstrous, not pale, fleshless, spectral. Malevolent, I thought, and think it was. At any rate, the eyes were large and open and fixed. It was pink, and I thought hot, and just above the eyes the border of a white linen drapery hung down from the brows. There was something horrifying in the sight of a face looking at one out of a frame as this one did more particularly if its gaze is unmistakably fixed on you. Nor does it make the matter any better if the expression gives no clue as to what is to come next. I said just now that I took this face to be malevolent, and so I did, but not in regard to any positive dislike or fierceness which it expressed. It was, indeed, quite without emotion. I was only conscious that I could see the whites of the eyes all around the pupil, and that, we know, has the glamour of madness about it. The immovable face was enough for me. I fled, but what I thought must be a safe distance inside my own precincts, I could not but halt and look back. There was no white thing framed in the hole of the gate, but there was a draped form shambling away among the trees. It did not press me with questions as to how I bore myself when it became necessary to face my family again. That I was upset by something I had seen must have been pretty clear, but I am very sure that I fought off all attempts to describe it. Why I make a lame effort to do it now, I cannot very well explain. It undoubtedly has had some formidable power of clinging through the years to my imagination. I feel that even now I should be circumspect in passing that plantation gate. And every now and again the query haunts me. Are there here and there sequestered places which some curious creature still frequent? whom once on a time anybody could see and speak to as they went about on their daily occasions. Whereas now, only at rare intervals in a series of years does one cross their paths and become aware of them. And perhaps that is just as well for the peace of mind of simple people. The End